Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the narrow gate. We had a week off last week, but this is where we enter the narrow gate of scripture, see what God was saying to his people back then and what he is saying to us now. I'm Doug Hout. That is Andrew Vuksik. Welcome. How smooth you are, Douglas, on that opening. You know, it's just like this natural for you now, huh? Yeah, it's just a piece of cake. But we missed last week because you're doing construction in your house. Yes, I've got uh, calluses all over my hands yeah. and, you know. <laughs> yeah, as our, as our old pastor at Spanish River Church, David Nicholas, used to say, is these hands were made for preaching. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Mine are just simply to hold the Bible. I can do nothing else with these hands. <laughs> yeah, but we have construction, a little expansion on uh, the house church a little bit because we're nice. becoming a mega church, Dougie. I love that. I yeah, love just that. mega. Well, you know what it is, Dougie? I finally... Uh, I saw the light. I figured if I tell people what they want to hear and I give them what their sinful desires want, we'll get a huge crowd, Dougie. Don't offend them. Be friendly. Be very short in your messages. Dougie. That is the secret to church growth, Douglas. It's working, huh? It's working. Now we're Not knocking out walls, walls, and it's just mega. It's just That's mega, awesome. Dougie. Good, 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 yeah. good, good. And don't worry, I already told Danielle. Once everything's done and they're all gathered here, I'm going right back to my hard-hitting verse-by-verse expositional. And I said, Danielle, they will all leave, and boom, we've got more room in our home. <laughs> Okay, so viewers, be, be ready for our great narrow gate today as we bring the thunder. The thunder, the yes. sons of thunder, James and John coming at you. There you go. Yeah, but the, yes, yeah. so we had construction, it was a little loud last week. We were planning on filming, but I had to contact you and Dayon about a half hour beforehand and said, no, it was work. loud in here. Right, right, right. All right, yeah. so... You went to New York City, if I recall. I right? went to New York City with my with my wife and uh, a couple friends of ours to watch our daughter Emma run in the New York Marathon for the second time. So that was pretty exciting. She finished five seconds faster than she did the first time. So, I mean, I had to kind of say, you mean you couldn't get a second for each mile? That'd be 26 oh. seconds. Man, are you one of Five those seconds. type of fathers, huh? Yes, I am. I'm like, listen, use your married name now from now on because <laughs> a haupt would have gotten better than five seconds over 26 A haupt would have never even smelled the second mile. No. How no. many miles? Did she ran 26. 26.2. That Doug, is really? Marathon. Yes, and then they finish. And they go, you got to keep walking. You got to keep walking. They got to walk like a mile more. Well, yet to uh, uh, just to get the lactic acid out or what? Yeah. yeah yes. And to <laughs> move out of the way because there's 20 so many people, people. coming after you. <laughs> our, our niece, Emily, uh, does PR for the corporation she works for up in New York City. And uh, she was there filming and kind of doing a thing because I don't know if I don't, I, I think maybe her corporation was like a sponsor. And so uh, she had sent out some videos to the family, her kind of being the, um, uh, you know, the reporter, so, for, so to speak. And uh, she was at the finish line. She was at the starting line. I mean, that's a big deal they do up there. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was, it was very cool. It was very yeah. cool. We and where were to, you guys uh, situated? We went to three different uh, spots. We had a we had a native New Yorker kind of leading us. Nice. And he did a great job. My and my son in law, who knows New York pretty well, that was his friend. And so they they had it all scoped out. We went to the ten uh, ten mile mark to begin with, then the eighteen mile mark, and then the twenty four mile mark. And so we we got to see Emma all three times. Give her a high yeah. five as she went by. Wow. Uh, and so it was how did how did she like I mean, well, if she did five seconds better, that's that's great. Yes. Um was that a struggle? Uh no, not as much as the first time. She basically ran eight 
12, eight minutes, 12 seconds miles the whole time, which was what she wanted. Last time really? she, she went out fast and then yeah. was, was hurting. So, so this she, is her second time doing it. Yes. Yeah. So she kind of maybe has a better feel mentally how to, yeah, yeah. Yep. that's still brutal. 26. Can you, Doug, I can't no. drive a car for 26 miles. No, no. Cause we, we had to walk a lot. We took the subway, you know, in between and everything. We had to walk a lot and she's like, Oh, my legs feel rubbery. I'm like, so do mine. <laughs> I walked about seven miles today. I'm, <laughs> I'm gas kiddo. I don't and how was she, you. how was she feeling the uh, subsequent following days? Uh, I think, okay. I don't know. I haven't talked to her. I'm still getting over the five seconds only. Is that what it is? Yeah. yeah. You're a tough father. Well, I, um, you know, train up a child. That's yeah. I finish the sentence. That's nothing to do with. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. Listen, Hey, let's get to it, man. We are in the book of Exodus we're still and, there. Uh, yeah, we've been studying this nation of people we learned about in Genesis called uh, the Israelites, the Hebrews, the Jews. Um, and they are now slaves in the land of Egypt um, under a pharaoh who is uh, pretty wicked? tough, pretty wicked and pretty tough and pretty hard hearted. God has selected a guy named Moses to be their deliverer. He basically showed up, we saw in Exodus chapter three, he showed up in a burning bush and basically said to Moses, I've heard the cry of my people. I'm going to set them free through you. You're going to do it. You're going to go to Pharaoh. You're going to ask for them to be set free. But then God said, but Pharaoh is going to have a hard heart. And uh, we're going to go through uh, a, a long process. And we're, we're in the middle of that process right now. There are several plagues that God has put onto Egypt to convince Pharaoh to change his mind and let the Israelites go. We've seen, uh, I believe we've seen seven of them. Right. And First plague would have been blood in the blood. Nile, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, second one, frogs, Dougie, everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. Third one, the gnats. Gnats. Everywhere. And then remember, Dougie, God said when it came to the fourth plague that, and that plague was the flies. Remember, God said at this point, none of these plagues are going to come near my people in Goshen. I'm going to show you in the Egyptians the difference between my people and you. So you've got they're, the flies. Number they're not four. Going to, the Israelites are not going to experience the plagues the way the Egyptians do. Correct. And then plague five, the livestock were diseased. Plague six, the boils on all the Egyptians. Imagine that. And remember, Dougie, we saw recently like, even the magicians and some of Pharaoh's officials are saying to Pharaoh, what are you doing? Yeah. Just say, uncle, let him go. Yep. And did we do the seventh? We Play did. Hail. 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 All right. Hail. And did we do the eighth? No, we're at, we're at chapter 10 today. We're at the locust. Oh, that's a little oof. locust. And so... Man, Pharaoh, talk about being arrogant, stiff neck. Remember, he would go to Moses after a couple of the plagues and say, okay, I give up, I give up. Just, just, ask, just ask your God to stop this on us and I'll let you. And then what would happen? God would relent. He'd stop and then Pharaoh would say, no, actually, I'm not going to let you go. Right. And he was just digging himself pretty big hole himself and all the people in egypt right exactly exactly so now we are at i assume the eighth plague yep chapter 10 of the book of exodus how about i pray yeah oh yeah yes yeah, sorry we gotta <laughs> prep. yeah lord thank you that we can be back together thank you for uh lord your power your majesty your infinite wisdom and perfection. 
And Lord, the fact that you sovereignly rule and reign over all, you're the creator of all, and you rule over all. And those who attempt to mock you, as Pharaoh did, well, Lord, we see that it is a fool's attempt to try to go against you, the true living God. Thank you that you've humbled our hearts. Thank you that we are no longer hostile towards you at war against you, but rather by your grace, you've saved us. We now submit to you in your word. We worship and adore you. And we don't want to oppose you. We want to magnify and exalt you. We pray for your blessings on our study now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. Chapter 10, book of Exodus, beginning where I always like to begin a chapter in the first verse. Well, look at you, Dougie. Then the Pharaoh said to Moses, go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his Wait heart. a second. Wait a second. Could you read that verse again, please? Then the Lord said to Moses. Excuse me. Then the Lord said to Moses, listeners, did you catch his little mess up there? Just rewind it on your, on your computer there, listeners. He started out saying, then Pharaoh said to Moses. Dougie, you still up in New York City? Exhausted from America? Said? Yeah, I think that's what you said. And even if you didn't, I don't care. Then the Lord said to Moses. I like that pause, that pause of, you know, emphasis. Go ahead, Dougie. Then the Lord said to Moses, go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine among them, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your grandson how I have dealt with harshly with the Egyptians and what signs I have done among them that you may know that I am the Lord. Wow. Hey, Moses, um, all this that's happening, don't think Moses that this is like a tug of war struggling match between me, God and Pharaoh. Um, I could literally just destroy him and the Egyptians like in a millisecond, but I'm kind of letting this happen so that I can give very clear proof of my power and majesty so that you, Moses, and all the Israelites going forward can tell their children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, how I, Yahweh, in my version says, made a mockery of Pharaoh and the Egyptians. So verse three, Dougie. Well, we, uh, before we move on, yep. just to remind you, uh, because we've talked about this several times, it says, I have hardened his heart. And again, people will sometimes go, well, wait a minute, then, then Pharaoh is blameless. Poor Pharaoh. It's not, it's not his fault. Well, we've talked about that. Pharaoh's heart was plenty hard. And basically God is allowing him to go where he wanted to go in the first place. But there's also a purpose to that, and he gives it to us here. You, you just mentioned it to show God's glory. So there's a reason for it. Yes, um, we can tend to uh, start pointing fingers at God very quickly, <laughs> um, but He has a, a purpose, a good one, and part of it is for us to see His power and recognize Correct. that He is God, the one true and only God. Um, so that's for our benefit, as well as the Israelites. Verse Very three. good. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your country, and they shall cover the face of the land so that no one can see the land, and they shall eat what is left to you after the hail, and they shall eat every tree of yours that grows in the field, and they shall fill your houses and the houses of all your servants and of all the Egyptians, as neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have seen from the, from the day they came on this, on earth to this day. Then he turned and went out from Pharaoh. Wow, Dougie. As we've been saying, these plagues 
not only um, were meant to, you know, hit the Egyptians, but also to be an attack against the various different Egyptian gods and goddesses that they worship. Mm -hmm. right. The lo the locust god said a piece. Uh, this was an attack. Well, okay, I'm going to bring locusts. Let's see what your locust god can do ab again about this, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. And so, Dougie, at this point, again, all that, if I'm Pharaoh and all that I've, or, you know, seen so far, yeah, we're in the eighth round now of this boxing match, and it's not going well for me. No, every time Moses has said, hey, this is going to happen, it happened. Yeah. Right. And it's like, uh, you know, I need Dougie, you're in my corner as my trainer saying, uh, you know, I'm throwing in the towel. No, no, no. You're not going to throw in the towel. I can do this. I can defeat him. I can do this. Now I'm here in the eighth round, Dougie. And all of a sudden I hear about all these locusts and they're going to cover uh, every inch of land, except obviously the land where the, the Israelites were staying there in Goshen. It's coming. Yeah. I, I At this point, just throw in the towel. Verse 7. Then Pharaoh's servants said to him, How long shall this man be a snare to us? Let the men go that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not understand that Egypt is ruined? I mean, the people, the Egyptians in the stands are saying, Throw in the towel. Enough. Enough. So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh, and he said to them, go serve the Lord your God, but but which ones are to go? Wait a second. So he's going to let him go finally, Dougie? Eighth, well, eighth, the eighth round, he's letting him go. It's It seems like that. Let's keep reading. But which ones are to go? Moses said, we will go with our young and our old. We will go with our sons and daughters and with all our uh, with our flocks and herds, for we must hold a feast to the Lord. But Pharaoh said to them, the Lord be with you if ever I let you and your little ones go. Look, you have some evil purpose in mind. No, go the men among you and serve the Lord, for that is what you are asking. And they were driven out of the Pharaoh's presence. Ah, so Pharaoh's like, nah. And you got this locust plague just hanging out there. I mean, he's got his own people saying to him, can you just give up? So he calls in Moses. Kind of looks like he's going to let him go. Well, who, who's going? But not all of them. Yeah, my, my adults, the children, the flocks, of course. We got to go to the mountain to worship. Got to have animals so we can offer sacrifices. Got to take our kids with us. Everybody's going. Nah. Not happening, Pharaoh said. So guess what happens? Verse 12. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, so that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every plant in the land, all that the hail has left. So Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day and all that night. When it was morning, the east wind had brought the locusts. The locusts came up over all the land of Egypt and settled on the whole country of Egypt. Such a dense swarm of locusts as had never been before, nor ever will be again. They covered the face of the whole land so that the land was darkened, and they ate all the plants in the land and all the fruit of the trees that the hail had left. Not a green thing remained, neither tree nor plant of the field through all the land of Egypt. Yeah, Dougie, they just imagine that scene. Uh, pretty bad. Locusts everywhere. Verse 16, then Pharaoh hastily called Moses and Aaron. <laughs> okay, bring those guys back in and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you again. For the eighth time yeah now therefore forgive my sin please only this once and plead with your lord with the lord your god only to remove this death from me whoa so, pharaoh's about to come to the lord so i sense an altar call here <laughs> so he went out from pharaoh and pleaded with the lord and the lord turned the wind into a very strong west wind 
which lifted the locusts and drove them into the Red Sea. Not a single locust was left in all the country of Egypt. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the people of Israel go. Yeah, game over. There's no... Yeah. Pharaoh kept hardening his heart, hardening his heart, hardening his heart, trying to make a mockery of God. All the while, every time Pharaoh was hardening his heart, it just became harder and harder. You get to the point where finally God just judiciously hardens. It is over. There is no repentance ever that will come. Well, we see people like that in our world today, don't we? Mm -hmm. They keep hardening their hearts, laughing at God, mocking God, thinking they're their own God. And they actually think, Doug, that, well, I don't believe in the Lord like you do. They think they're being indifferent. They're not being indifferent. They're being like Pharaoh. They are denying the light of truth that God has graciously given, both in creation as well as written revelation. And they deny, and they deny, and they deny. All the while, they're just hardening their hearts more and more. Mm -hmm. And then there comes a point. God judiciously hardens, game over. It's interesting. The, the, the struck me as we were reading. Um, Moses is asking Pharaoh to allow the Hebrews to go worship and serve the Lord. Pharaoh wants the Hebrews to worship and serve him. Right. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's almost like there's a choice. You can say, I want all to serve me or I will serve God. Yep. There you go. Great and so, point. And and when that happens, we, we see the results of it all around us of, mm -hmm. of people who are saying, no, nope, serve me, not God. Yep. Um, and the results are not great. No. And, and we see that throughout the throughout all of scripture. Okay, so, so we're getting this plague was plague. bad. This plague was bad. But Dougie, we're not done yet. No, verse 21. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt. So now we have the ninth plague, Dougie. Yeah. Darkness against their sun god, Ra. Ra. It says uh, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness to be felt. Oh, can you imagine that? This was going to be, this isn't just, there's no light. It's bigger than that. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was pitch darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the people of Israel had light where they lived. They didn't lose the electricity, huh? Then Pharaoh called Moses and said, go serve the Lord. Your little ones also may go with you. Only let your flocks and your herds remain behind. I'm he, not going to give you up see all control. Do you see that, Dougie? But Moses said, you must also let us have sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Our livestock also must go with us. Not a hoof shall be left behind, for we must take of them to serve the Lord our God. And we do not know with what we must serve the Lord until we arrive there. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. And he would not let them go. Then Pharaoh said to him, get away from me. Take care never to see my face again. For on the day you see my face, you shall die. Moses said, as you say, I will not see your face again. Whoa. We've got nine plagues. First few hitting the entire land, then God says, let me show you this one. I'm going to make a distinction between my people and the Egyptians. Those subsequent plagues did not come near God's people. 
just pounded on the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. Pharaoh's officials, the magicians are crying uncle. They're saying, Pharaoh, wake up. Don't you see what's happening here? We're being destroyed. And there's Pharaoh kind of bartering with Moses. All right, I'll let some of you go. But as you said, Doug, Doug I'm not giving up full control. And it's interesting, Moses, you know, uh, I was just thinking that he, he, he didn't compromise. I mean, when he says, all right, I'm, I'm going to let the kids go, but you can't take the livestock. I, you know, for some reason, Moses uh, is, is very sure what God wants. Yep. Um, that he wants everyone to go. Right. Because I think it would be easy for him to say, you know, you know what? That's not bad. We all we all get to go. We just can't take our Yeah. Answers. Do you think maybe Moses's confidence was growing ever stronger as as he's, he's growing... witnessing these plagues? <laughs> and you think the Israelites, because think about it, when we started this, right? When Moses showed up and tells the Israelites, hey, you know, God sent me to be your deliverer, blah, blah, blah. The people are high-fiving, and then Pharaoh gets wind of it. And remember, he forces labor, extreme oppressive labor on the uh, Israelites. Yeah. And they found out the reason for that was because of Moses, you know, saying, hey, I'm, you know, we're here to let the Israelites go. Well, remember how the Israelites responded, Dougie, to Moses. Yeah, they were mad at him. Right? You, you brought this on us. And then remember how Moses responded to God saying, ever since I came here, and kind of brought this good news. <laughs> Is it, am I doing the right thing, God? Because yeah. it certainly doesn't seem like it's working out that way. Yeah. And so you see, how would we say, a little wishy-washy? <laughs> Wishy-washy-ness. I don't know if I, it's a word. Um, both in Moses and the Israelites at the beginning. But Dougie, notice we don't see any of that now. Like no. you said, Moses is like, no, nah, there's no compromise here. There's no, you know, give and take here. We're going to do exactly what the Lord said. We're not going to leave one soul behind, human or animal. And we're going to go worship our Lord because he is worthy. Pharaoh says, well, can't we just make a deal? Let's just make a deal. I'll let the adults go. No, nope, kids got to go too. And the animals. All right. A couple of plagues come. Pharaoh goes, okay, I'll let the adults and the kids go, but not the flocks. No, we need flocks to be. And again, Dougie, can you imagine like you don't get any hint that the Israelites are coming to Moses and pulling on his robe and saying, Moses, take the deal. Take the deal. <laughs> Right? Yeah, you don't. And and so the, the, so Moses's faith is growing. Their faith is growing. We're 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 guessing at that, but I think as you see God work in your life, your faith grows. That's one of the reasons why people who have walked with God for a long time, who've been Christians for a long time, have such a a, a history to look back on. Correct. And and we should do that. We should do that. Um, we're going to see that. God is very, uh, very um, serious about his people remembering the things that he's done. We're going to see uh, later on in the Old Testament. Yep. There's places where he's told them, make a memorial. Put this put this on there so that your kids will ask, why? What, what are these for? Correct. Well, so that they say, well, this is what God did. Correct. And as we're going to see next week with the 10th and final plague, the Passover, God even institutes a special holiday every year that the Jews were to celebrate that which God did when he would release the Egyptians through the 10th or the Israelites through the 10th plague of the Passover. So you're absolutely correct, Doug, that God's mighty works really not only point to God's greatness in the present when he's doing those works, but also would allow God's people to look back and remember his mighty works, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why I go real quick to James chapter one. Verse 
verses two and three. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Would it be safe to say, Dougie, that the Israelites and even Moses and Aaron had encountered some trials down there in Egypt? Absolutely. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Question, Dougie. I think it's fair to say? First plague? Pharaoh doesn't repent? You think it's fair to say that Moses is going, huh? I wonder how this is all going to turn out. Sure. Second plague? Mo, uh, Pharaoh still doesn't repent, but you think maybe that even that trial, Moses now is starting to develop some faith, more faith in God and perseverance? Absolutely. How about after the third plague? Fourth plague? Fifth plague? You see Moses' faith growing. I'm not going to say he started to feel sorry for Pharaoh, <laughs> but I think it's probably at that point, Moses is going, you fool, Pharaoh. Why in the heck was I afraid of this guy when I first showed up here? This guy's a moron. Right. Right? Yeah. My I, I, God is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's probably still saying, I'm not sure how it's going to end, but it's it's going to end good for us and not good for him. Right. Yep. I'm convinced of that, Moses is probably saying. Absolutely. Probably saying. And and again, you know, dear listeners, that that's really the point. You know, people say, Well, you know, why is it that we as believers seem to always go through so many trials? Well, I mean, number one, because we live in a fallen world. That comes along with the deal, right? Right. We're fallen. We're surrounded by fallen people. We're in a fallen world. You know, what do you expect? You're going to have people attack you verbally, physically, emotionally. Fallen people. Uh, you're going to see disasters and difficulties, many of them that come directly at you. We live in a fallen world. And yet, as God's people, who have been set apart like the Israelites there in Egypt from the dark, evil world system. As God's people, we are protected and preserved. He will bring us home, right? Mm -hmm. He will release us from this fallen state. He'll bring us into glory. Okay, then why do I have to still go through trials down here? Can't God just, boom, get me up there? Well, he could. Just like he could have, boom, gotten the Israelites out of Egypt. But what does it do, Dougie, for you? When you go through a trial down here, and you're crying out to the Lord, and you're begging the Lord, God, please give me enough faith just to, just to keep, keep hanging in there, trusting in you, and all of a sudden God does something, and maybe it's not, fully what you anticipate or it's not yet at the end of the deal but nevertheless it's like whoa and suddenly boom another brick of faith is is put into the building and then another one and another one and another one suddenly you have boldness in the lord you have trust in the lord you have perseverance in the lord joy in the lord even through the trials because you go god is awesome and you worship him and you adore him and you praise him and you thank him. Not just for a trial, but thank him that he is sovereign over every trial. Right. And think about, Dougie, how that your faith is fortified and your confidence in the Lord is just fortified and it builds. And that's just going to carry you through all the way throughout eternity. I mean, I know some of the things that I used to be like, oh, when I was a young believer, God, I, I know the Bible says you can do this and that, but uh, I look back and I'm like, what in the world were you whining about, Andrew? Right. 
right? Yeah, we should have that confidence. And so even, even reading a story like this is to remind us of the fact that we actually, those bricks are, are built stronger in the trials. Yes. Uh, I mean, that verse in, in James that we just looked at, it says, consider it, consider it uh, joy. It's good. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. To have, to have these trials because they actually build real uh, faith bricks. There's a purpose for the trials, just like there was a purpose for what the Lord was doing there in Egypt. Again, think about it, Dougie. This clown Pharaoh was mocking our God. I mean, God could have just incinerated Pharaoh and the Egyptians like that, right? But he didn't. Mm -hmm. Not only was God showing Pharaoh, um, yeah, you're not God, I am. Not only was God showing the Egyptians, mm -hmm. and we're going to see when they're when the Israelites are released, and even some Egyptians went as well, because they said, we want to serve your God. Yeah. But also the faith of Moses, Aaron, uh, uh, the Israelites was built. And it's the same with us. So as we go through these trials and things aren't happening, maybe as quickly as we'd like them to happen, or as, you know, and uh, you know, is grand in, in such a grand old state that we would anticipate. Just be patient, mm -hmm. because God's got a purpose, not only in showing His power and majesty in front of others, but also to us, right, Dougie? Yeah. And go to Romans five, and we can conclude here if you want, Doug. All right. Romans five verses one through five, Dougie. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. The certainty of glory. But not only do we rejoice in that, Dougie, what else do we rejoice in verse 3? Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. There you go. We want to mature. God will use his word as a, an instrument to mature us. He'll use uh, worship. He'll use fellowship with God's people. He'll use trials. Right? Mm -hmm. But we already know the end result. Right, Dougie? Yeah. Kind of like Moses had been told the end result. Again, not sure that his faith was as strong at the beginning to believe that was going to happen. But boy, after each plague, you could just see Moses just getting bolder and bolder and not even thinking of acquiescing or compromising to Pharaoh's fickle demands. Right. We see his faith growing where he's certain that when God said, I'm going to deliver my people and I'm going to use you, Moses is at this point saying, that's what you're going to do. Don't know how, but we're heading that direction. There you go. And next week we will see the 10th and final plague, right? Yes, which is very powerful. And as you say, is still a, 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 a something that is done um, by Jewish people every year, yeah. uh, a, a celebration. Um, a remembrance of yep. the Passover. But we also remember the Passover as believers. And we'll talk more about that next week. Doug, would you close us in prayer? Absolutely. Lord, thank you for, uh, thank you again for your word, um, how you incredibly uh, put it all together through different authors over different times, how you protected it, 
uh, how you uh, uh, allowed it to be available to us today. It is the word of God. Spirit just as we read it. I pray that we'll recognize the truth that we've been talking about today about uh, about suffering because I know that there are probably people listening that are going through very very difficult times right now and, and we're certainly not minimizing them but recognizing that God uses those things to strengthen us as Joseph said to his brothers that we saw at the end of Genesis what you meant for evil God meant for good he is sovereign and he is working all things together for good for those who love him. And I pray that that can be, give us confidence today in the midst of our suffering, that that can give us praise today for our God, who is good, who is loving, and who is sovereign and all powerful. And, and as we've constantly said, who will do what he promises. One of those promises is for believers you have a, a home in heaven that Jesus is preparing for you. And it's going to be like no other home you've ever experienced before because it's going to be a true home. And we're going to be freed from sin and freed from death forever. We thank you for that, Lord. And we praise you for that. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, Dougie. You know, I was thinking I could probably break the record up in glory running a marathon. I bet you could. Although the guy in New York ran it in two hours and like four minutes. It was a record. So that's wait, bad. he averaged four minutes per mile. Yeah. For 26 miles. For 26. For something. For 20 or something. For 15, maybe. Yeah. They're fast. I bet you we can outdo that in glory, though. Doug. I, I don't know that there'll be any reason to run it. Exactly. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us, everybody. We will be looking at the Passover next time when we gather together on the narrow gate. Until then, have a wonderful week. Thank you, Douglas. See thank everybody. You. Thank you, B. Have a great day.